So we are back once again live. Uh, we are having another Ask a Pastor this evening, and we have a special edition this evening, which is a young adults Ask a Pastor. This is hot off the press. This has been asked this week after the back of uh, the young adults meeting on Sunday, yep. uh, the barbecue, some good conversation going. And um, we got a couple of questions sent in uh, for this. So are you ready? I'll do my best. Yeah, so if you didn't know already, it's the legendary Andy Lancaster who's going to take us through this tonight. And we have Claudia who's going to Hooray. be, obviously, getting the theological questions in with in me. In there too. And trying to massage every part of Lanky's brain tonight. We'll see what comes so, out. Yeah, we'll try, we'll try and uh, <laughs> see you put it together. So the subject was brought up uh, about having romantic relationships with a non-believer or someone from a different religion. Mm. What would you have to say on that kind of subject? Well, I think the Bible does speak to it in 2 Corinthians, where it talks about us being unequally yoked. Okay. And I think that would relate, quite honestly, uh, certainly to marriage. I think it might also even relate to some business partnerships. Um, and I think if you're going to choose to marry someone who is of a different faith, it will probably damage your own faith, but it will leave a gap somehow in the middle of your relationship. So one person I go to when I think about how you explain it there is Solomon. How obviously he was told not to marry outside of Israel. Uh, yeah. And he did, uh, which from, let's say, an administration and a leadership point of view as a kingdom choice seemed pretty good from obviously a human's wisdom to make treaties and peace treaties with other kingdoms right. and all kinds of stuff like that. But one of the things that happened, obviously you brought idolatry into Israel by building temples for mm -hmm. his new princesses and all kinds of stuff like that next to his temple and stuff. And it does say that obviously that, imp well, we see it impacted him and, and um, it did impact him because he got involved with those rituals of worship, mm. didn't he? Yes. So it impacted him there. Um, so, do you think that not only the outside, obviously, influences will Im impact your faith, but also what about from inside the church? Sort of, is it like Claudia, you were saying uh, in a previous conversation? Yeah, so we spoke about how in the church, is it enough just to love Jesus? And is that going to carry you through a marriage, or is it possible for us to be unequally yoked within the body of Christ? Okay. Well, let me just go back to the, the Second Corinthians passage okay. there. Um, I don't know if you have it. Do you have it there? Yeah, um, I've got the, the Second Corinthians 6.14, which is, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what, does, uh, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, uh, or what fellowship uh, can the light have with darkness? Yeah, okay. So... Um, being yoked together, being married, let's put it that way, which is one, I think, of the ways that we can use that passage, would mean that you were <clears throat> with someone who didn't share something that's at the very heart of your life. So if you're a Christian, Jesus comes first. He's the yeah. person that's at the center of your life. Mm. Now, if you choose to get married to someone who isn't a Christian, <clears throat> immediately you have the most important part of your life that you cannot share with that person. Mm -hmm. And that means that very likely you will be led away from your own faith, trying to appease the person who doesn't share. You know, yeah. what, what happens Sunday mornings? Do you always go to church or is it that some weeks you don't go to church because the other person doesn't want you to? It's as practical as that. You mentioned Solomon. Mm -hmm. Solomon was given wisdom. <laughs> the issue is not what gifts we're given, but whether we choose to use them or not. Okay. Right. And he chose to be unwise, mm. uh, ra even though he had the gift of wisdom, if you like. He was given wisdom from God. So I think being unequally yoked means that we are married to someone or, or in an, uh, um, a relationship with someone, whether it's business or marriage or whatever, in which there's something critical that we don't have in common. And that, that's not a something so much as a someone. It's Jesus of Nazareth, our saviour. So on my 
bookshelf is a book called Money, Sex and Communication. It's about Christian marriage. And at the heart of it is the idea that if communication is good, the other two areas work well. Um, if communication isn't there, then they won't work well either. It, it's just a simple fact. So if you cannot communicate with your husband or your wife about the most important person in your life, the one who has saved you and given you eternal life, there is a huge hole in the middle of your relationship which can't be filled. And then my further point would be to say that when you come uh, to the passage, and I've just forgotten the name of the book that talks about um, the three-chord strand. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, yeah. thank you. Um, it talks about the three-chord strand. So in Christian marriage, it's husband, wife, and Jesus. Mm. So you can't have this three-chord strand that's um, not easily broken in a marriage where two of the strands, you know, are not able to communicate over the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It feels to me like there's a strand missing already in that relationship. Now, I'm not saying that it can't work long-term and can't be married People can't be married for years. What I'm saying is there's a deep center of communication which cannot be had by that couple around faith in the person of Jesus Christ. So I, I would really encourage anybody not to pursue that line. If I may ask, actually, to be a bit more simplistic, when we say yoked, what yeah. do we actually mean by that? Yeah, okay. Well, one of the definitions of that, I think, would be... Um, my understanding is that, uh, for example, a rabbi's yoke would be th the things that they taught, the way that they instructed people to live. And so, if you like, when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, what he's saying is that, relatively speaking, there is a simplicity about how he calls us to live, mm. how he calls us to be to follow him. Okay. It's not detailed and complex like the Old Testament law. There's something much more simple around that. Uh, but you see, the first and greatest commandment for a Christian is still Matthew twenty two thirty seven. You shall love the Lord your God with mm -hmm. all your heart, soul, mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And the primary call on us is to love God. That's the primary call. Out of that flows the Great Commission. Go mm -hmm. into all the world, uh, you know, and... Um, make disciples yeah. but the first and primary call in my view is to love God and sometimes that means denying ourselves yeah so I want to again bring another angle to this sort of uh, imagery so to speak with because obviously when Jesus talks about yokes in other places uh, there's also the imagery that talking about being yoked excuse me to uh, an ox mm -hmm. which is um, which is all to do with farming, how you sow and how you work together. Mm -hmm. Because I was uh, doing a bit of sort of research prior to this. I was looking at a, a website which is about Christian marriage, and it's yeah. talking about when uh, the oxen in this form are sort of not yoked equally, they can't complete the tasks properly okay. as they sow in the field, sow in the seeds, and stuff like that. So if you can imagine, when Jesus is talking about it, he's talking about um, coming into line. Mm. Uh, and how young oxes are taught to sort of tread grain and tread yep. the field and stuff like that uh, through sort of a, um, a, a state of submission, let's say, through there and you know coming into line with what Jesus is doing as he walks his journey. Because I think you've mentioned a few times this quite stuck with me before, which is we come into God's plan, mm. Mm. not God into our plan. Right. You know mm. what I mean? So we're coming into line as young oxes being yoked to his teaching. Yeah. Um, but when it talks about the imagery of actually working together, you would never put a like a, a small ox with a big ox because you'd probably end up going askew. You wouldn't be able to tread equally across the field and you wouldn't be able to pull the things efficiently and all kinds of stuff like that. So I guess in this sort of format, when being coupled together in marriage, I guess, if you really want to live for God, uh, in everything for the way you're supposed to and how he's called for you, you probably really need to complement each other quite well to be able to live that out properly. Yeah, I but I, I think I'd want to go back again to the Old Testament origins of that picture of being unequally yoked, and it was actually to do with animal welfare. Okay. And so is the Bible, or should Christians be about animal welfare? Yes, because God was. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, so you know, if you have a yoke on a large animal and a small one, or two 
that are at different speeds. For example, I think uh. an ass and an ox. Mm -hmm. What you'd end up with is, is, you know, the rubbing of the yoke right. causing pain and oh, discomfort okay. Okay. on yeah. the animal. So yeah, there's nice. an animal welfare thing behind that. But that picture does carry on yeah. into marriage yep. in that you, you will cause pain, yeah. quite frankly, because you'd be, in a sense, spiritually moving at two different speeds. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and it would cause discomfort. It does cause chafing. It does cause you know, a problem between the two, being able to really go in the same direction in a kind of equal way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important picture to hold on to. I like that. Nice. So say, for example, in circumstances like that, what do you suggest? You know, I mean, how, how would that be dealt with? You, do you, would you again say maybe reassess it and maybe think before you get into any serious sort of situations like marriage and stuff, maybe reassess who you are for each other and how you are together? Or what do you think? Yeah, and I'll answer that. We need also to come back to Claudia's question in a okay. few minutes. Yes, uh, of course. Um, yeah, first of all, I think for many, many Christians that I talk to, the real challenge is getting them to actually believe that God loves them deeply and passionately just as they are. Yes. And I want to say to anybody who is listening to this, wherever you are, God loves you, Christ died for you, and the reality is you are deeply cher uh, cherished by the living God. Mm. Yeah. And so we sometimes have a subconscious thing that God wants to give us something that is second rate <laughs> yeah. um, or that God right. doesn't care about us so we've got to work out our own way forward. If, if, if we don't marry this person or you know, how is yeah. God gonna help us? Right. But you need to understand whoever you are, God cherishes you more than you will ever understand. Yeah. And so he is a good God and he loves us very much. So we do need to make it a matter of prayer. And mm. some of you listening will say, well, I have been praying for a long time. And all I can say to you is, look, you need to continue to pray and to trust this God who loves you mm. to bring into your life the right person, not the wrong one. Yeah. Um, and I think that's you know, really important. And, and the answer is, if someone is not a Christian, my advice to you from 20 odd years of experience and from scripture would be to say, I'm really sorry but don't start a relationship with someone that you're going to get attached to mm. that's not going to lead anywhere long term or is going to cause you pain at the pain. spiritual level. Yeah, of course. So come back to my question. your question. Yeah, would you repeat that for us? Would you um, like? So it was essentially about within the church, is it enough for you to just love Jesus and go and get married or is it possible to be unequally yoked within the church? And I think we actually spoke about this, about being maybe spiritually not, at the same yeah, level where that might question. cause some pains. But again, is it possible to be unequally yoked within in the body of Christ? Um, I'm, I'm not sure in that sense uh, that it is. I think very often when two Christians come together, it may well be possible that one is in some areas further on than the other spiritually. Yeah. It might be the other way around in other areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think there is a growing together as marriages are growing together. You know, you learn, have to learn all kinds of things in marriage, uh, respecting and, and caring for the other person. And of course you get married because you care about the other person. You know, so your, your aim is to put the other person first. It's mm -hmm. not just to please that you get pleased. Um, I think that um, once again, the, the basis of attraction is different for different people. Okay. Yeah. So for some people, physical attraction in the first place is an absolute must. Right. You know, they must look at the person across the room and think, wow, <laughs> uh, there must be something about them. It might be the way they dress, it might be the way they look, but, but there's that you know, initial thing. For other people, a relationship grows out of communication. Okay. You know, they talk for a while and they think, actually, this person is really nice and really interesting. And maybe I, I wouldn't have you know, walked across the room another time, but now I've got to know them. Mm. You know, so I think there are different ways of attracting. So there's emotional, intellectual, okay. you know, physical. And for different people, there are, if you like, different priorities. Of course. But, but if you're a Christian, you're looking for another Christian. Okay. Okay, yeah. you're not looking for somebody who isn't a Christian. Christian. Yeah, cool. um, just to end that off, I think I'd like to clarify something. So we spoke about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Yes. But in let's have a look. In First Corinthians chapter seven, it speaks about the unbelieving wife or the unbelieving husband. Yes. But from what I understand that's in the context of if you were married to them and you were both unbelievers 
and one of you becomes a believer, yes. you don't then go and leave them or divorce them. Yeah. No, that's right. And actually, I think the emphasis on, and I haven't looked, but I think but the emphasis yeah. is on the uh, unbeliever choosing to divorce the believer. Okay. I think that's what that passage says. It's known as the Pauline exception. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that is, you know, a possibility. But I think before we get there, I mean, what we're talking about, I guess, today is about attraction between two believers mm -hmm. and, and first of all I'd want to say look find a believer let's believe that God loves you so much that he's mm -hmm. got the right person for you although for some people a celibate lifestyle a single lifestyle is actually works out to be absolutely fine and, and yeah. what they enjoy yeah for real you know, to, marriage isn't the only way of being fulfilled no right it's not. yeah it's not like the, the be all and end all is it I think that you know a if you look at it scripturally, Paul talks about, you know, it's, it's sometimes better to be single. Yes. You know what I mean? So you can maximize your time with God. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In, in, in many ways that you wouldn't be able to if you had other responsibilities mm -hmm. that God wanted you to honor as well, like like wife, kids and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that, or partner and kids or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. But um, I'm going to kind of link this to another question that was uh, sent in as well, which is... Um, why is the church so divided nowadays into denominations? How would I know what to choose based on the title of the church? Example, Baptist and Methodist. And I'm linking that in a, in a strange way. It's quite a weird thing to link it with. But um, when I think about all this, like being equally yoked and um, not being yoked to someone who's outside of the faith for faith reasons, um, I always think about the Amos 3.3 3 verse, which is do not, uh, so, so um, sorry, to do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think some other different translations put it is how can two walk together if they do not agree? Agree. You know, so um, in the light of that, why has there been so much sort of splitting of the churches over the history of time? A big Just question. Around, so to speak. It is, and it's a big question. And I, first of all, in, in many respects, I think it's very sad. I, I think... Unfortunately, when Jesus, in some situations, Jesus ceases to be Lord and people's own role within the church or their own beliefs um, come in and you have this forming of factions, different belief over different things. Now, I think until Jesus comes again, different parts of the church will hold to some different emphases. Um, the question is, can we love each other holding a different emphasis? Um, or must we, you know, build a barricade and keep the others out, etc.? Um, and I, I hope that we can do what Jesus calls us to do in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. That's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbour as yourself. Even the church needs to do that because there are sometimes legitimate disagreements on scriptural passages about yeah. principles. Then, secondly, I think what happens is that. Um, the church may lose an emphasis for a while. So, for example, when the Methodists were formed, it felt like, if you look back, that the church in the UK had lost its emphasis on discipleship right. and on evangelism and on holy living. And so the Methodist church kind of burst out of the Anglican church, if you like, <clears throat> bringing all those messages in a way that, that brought a renewal both here and in America on a massive scale. So it was as if God needed to stir some people up who were open to him to reintroduce that, those kind of principles in the church. And then you go a bit further, you find the Salvation Army comes because people have lost that desire to minister into the most needy people of the, con of the country. Right, okay. Okay. And so, so all of a sudden you have the Salvation Army formed um, in a you know, very unusual, very different group of Christians, but with a tremendous heart to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people literally in the gutter, you know, wow. the, the drunken women, the music halls, all that kind wow. of stuff. And then when you come to the turn of the last century, you have the rise of the Pentecostal movement yeah. mm -hmm. because it seems like the church had forgotten the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. And God needed to stir some people up to reintroduce those things back in to the body of Christ. Um, I guess the problem with the church is it's made of human beings. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we get it wrong. We're flawed, we fail. And God from time to time has to raise up, if you like, or to remind his church of key issues which we've let go of or we've forgotten.
That is super interesting, though, because so just bringing it back slightly more to the question, because I guess it is, it, as we are humans and we're, in, we're individuals, probably every single person who holds a pl position or place in those different denominations would say each version is the right one to be. So this is the thing about it. So is there a specific one that is the right one to be in, so to speak? Because I know, for example, my godfather was a lay preacher in a Methodist church, and then the Holy Spirit taught him about the Holy Spirit actually being around now. Around. You can, he's here, he's alive, he's still doing miracles, mm. you know? Uh, so now he would consider himself to be charismatic mm. out of the Methodist church by sort of divine intervention, so to speak. And then there's, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, because I think that as people, we kind of like to point at each other and say, oh, your theology is wrong, or this is wrong, or that's wrong, and, you know, you shouldn't be that, and shouldn't be this, and, you you know, Sabbath is just for a Saturday, or you can have a Sabbath right mm. through the week. You know, all these kind of complications that mm. come with all these splits of denominations, because it is simple, as the fact what Paul was saying, that it's um, salad or meat, whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God, however you do it, uh, and don't sort of focus too much on what those not meaning, meaningless or trivial actions, but, you know, those things are just for the individual, what God's got for them and how they're glorifying God in their life. Or is it just as simple as finding a spirit-filled church, no matter what denomination it's painted as? Well, I think the, the bottom line is um, that uh, there's probably no stream or section of the church that has absolutely perfect theology. No. You know, I think there's things that we can learn from each other, but there are central things which I believe a real Christian holds to be true. Mm -hmm. So we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, yeah. that he did die, that he was raised from death, um, that he did die for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15 wonderfully describes that. It, it, it says, Paul says, for what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared, first of all, to Peter, and then to 12, and then to 500 plus, and then to, to uh, the apostles, I think, and then to James. And then Paul says, he appeared to me as one born out of time. There's a central statement of faith there. Now, there might be all kinds of other things around that, but again, Paul writing in Romans says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And, and the New Testament tells us that it's our faith response to what God did for us in the person of Jesus Christ that saves us. Yeah. Not necessarily our theology of the Holy Spirit or, or our theology of, of church in our ecclesiology. Those are not the things that save us. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that doesn't come from ourselves. That's a that's gift from true. God. Yeah. Mm. So you've got something to say. Yeah, so yeah. when you were speaking about that, I was just reminded of um, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, and where it speaks about we're commanded to love one another. Yes. Mm. And everyone will know that we are his disciples yeah. by how we love one another. And yes. I guess with all this mixture of I go here, I'm yeah, from here, yeah. and we kind of nitpick, nitpick at each other and we don't love. Yeah, but yeah. how is the world supposed to know that we are actually of Christ if we do not love each other? And what mm -hmm. does that actually look like when we have those differences? Mm -hmm. are, we f are we really focusing on, like what you said, what are the key foundations of our faith? Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus? And then how do we, well, be his hands and feet on the earth mm -hmm. rather than we go to church on Saturday and, you, and you're on Sunday and we eat meat, you don't. It's mm. a lot to cut. I think from the outside, people look at us and think, what is going on? Yeah, of course. What is this? It looks a, a bit of a mess. And I think maybe we don't realise how much of a mess we look to people sometimes. Mm. And I really feel we need to organise ourselves. Like get, I think we, I think the gospel is so key. Yeah. Mm. We've forgotten that it's about him. Yes. Mm. And I wonder if there's a way we can get back to that, to that unity, because I think that will make all the difference because there's chaos everywhere. Yeah. Yes. And the world needs us. Yeah. And I think they'll get to a point where we need to realise we need to come together and to kind of lay aside yeah. all that stuff. 
Yeah, I hear that absolutely. I think it's true. I think it does happen to some extent. I mean, I know as a pastor in the city, I know lots of other pastors in the city. And in the past, we've, we've run events together where the, the, the slight theological differences that we might hold or the, the slight differences in how we think church should be done, mm -hmm. they, they, we recognise those as not critical. Right. Um, and uh, so we worked together, for example, on a citywide alpha uh, or love leads or some of the big events okay. that we've done. The whole story many years ago was a citywide you know, Christian event. So those things do happen. I suppose also then God puts churches in particular areas mm -hmm. and maybe there's a call for them to minister into that particular locality, okay. which is God has put them there to do. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, we can't all be working in every area. No. We have to work where we sense that God has us. And I wonder sometimes whether this mega creative God has actually created a kind of variety of different churches yeah. because there's a variety of different of people, people out there. So some people want a church that is, you know, it's flashing lights and it's disco type music and it's loud and it's just where they're at. And other people want to sit quietly mm -hmm. in a very darkened church and listen to prayers that have been pre-prepared. And it's God who judges the heart, not us. Mm -hmm. We can work with anybody who believes Jesus Christ is Lord and the only saviour. So the issue comes when we impose that on other people. Yeah, to some extent, you know, and, and I think, um, yeah, I think what we, when we judge other people, I think once we understand that someone is a Christian who believes that Jesus Christ is the only saviour who died for us in, mm -hmm. rose again, and our trust in him, our faith in him is what leads us to live for him in this life and to be with him in eternity. Mm -hmm. Once we understand that someone has that faith, that understanding that we have, yep. you know, we can work with those people, even okay. if there are differences in, in other areas. That's the fundamental, fundamental. thing. Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know, Jesus Christ is Lord is what people have died for down through the centuries. If you were a Roman citizen and you wanted in some markets under the Emperor Domitian to um, trade, if, if you were a single mum, for example, and you were needing to trade some things that you'd made during the week in order to feed your children, all you'd have to do is sprinkle incense on an altar and say, Caesar is Lord. Right. But as Christians... People couldn't do that. Do that no. And so they would be excluded from the market because wow. Jesus was Lord. There's always been a cost to Jesus is Lord. Always been a cost to that. And there always will be. Wow. Did not know that. Did not know that. Yeah, that is some straight facts mm. for your brains right there. We are going to actually uh, close it there because we have been having a natter for a long time now. Yes. But thank you again, Andy Lancaster for taking us through those questions and um, we've got more from the young adult section coming up uh, and lots more questions that have been firing through with things to definitely test your skill uh, but we thank you andy claudia thank and you. we'll thank see you. you again next week god bless bye bye, bye.